A few months ago, I made a beginner's guide to ant keeping to help those who are thinking about becoming an ant keeper or for those who are just starting out. Since that upload, my collection and experience has evolved. Now I have over 25 colonies across 20 different species, plus quite a few queen ants on their own. It's time to make the next video of this series, the advanced guide to ant keeping. In this episode, we'll look at over 30 tips and tricks to help you become the ultimate ant keeper. But first, hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Ant Keeper, where I upload every week about all things ant related. If you find yourself enjoying this video, then subscribe and join the AK Colony. Your support really helps me out and I really appreciate it. Also, I have set the goal for this channel to hit 2000 subscribers by this channel's one year anniversary. It's a big goal, but I think we can hit it. How can you help, you may wonder? If you're watching this video and you're not already subscribed, then you know what to do. Click the button and subscribe. Also, watch the weekly videos all the way through. It's easy, just walk away. I I'm just kidding. Mute it first and then walk away. <laughs> Honestly though, your support has been amazing. If we can hit the 2000 subscribers by the 4th of September, I'll do another giveaway. These tips and tricks are ideas and concepts I've learned through trial and error. I've owned over 100 queen ants and colonies so far, and I want to share what I have learned to help those who are looking to bring themselves up to the next level. Also, after watching through this episode, if you have any great tips I haven't mentioned, write it in the description below to help everyone out in the community. Feeding your ants is kind of a big deal. Now, when I say that, you may think, well, in the wild, Ants eat pretty much everything and they seem to do all right. So what I feed them shouldn't matter, right? Well, what you feed them and how you feed them, as well as your overall husbandry will make a significant difference in how long your colony survives and how quickly the colony grows. Depending on the species and how many workers you have, you have to feed them pretty often. When I started keeping ants, the first mistake I made was not feeding my ants enough. So how much should you feed your ants then? Well, it depends. But for a guide, you never want your queen or colony to run out of sugar or honey. So if you're going to feed your queen or colony and they've eaten all the honey, you're not feeding them regularly enough. Try a day sooner until there's always a small supply of sugar left over. When I feed my colonies, I found using a syringe to apply the honey to be the fastest and cleanest method for distribution. If I'm feeding all my ants in test tubes, I cut out little squares of aluminium foil and put a droplet in the center. Keeping the honey on the foil instead of just placing the honey directly inside the test tube helps keep the test tube clean. Personally, I prefer to use pure honey for the sugar source since honey is the only food in the world that doesn't go off. However, if you dilute it with water, it eventually will go moldy. I've noticed that some types of ants are defensive when I remove the cotton from the end. Often all the workers will try and run out and attack. If this happens to you, generally it means you either have too many workers for the space and you need to move the colony into a bigger housing setup, or if there's only a few ants in the test tube, you just need to be at one with yourself and be a ninja. I sometimes place honey on a fresh piece of cotton, then stick what protein I'm using onto the honey, then quickly swap the cotton pieces. If you're quick, you only need two to three seconds and you're done. If you're not sure, you can always practice with an empty test tube first. When fitting your ants, you have many choices. You could use a liquid feeder, or you could use a bottle cap with a small twig in case a worker falls in and gets stuck. Or you can make a dish like this one. When it comes to protein, you have plenty of choices, but there are some important things to keep in mind. Once you own several colonies or a big colony, you'll be tempted to catch wild insects to feed your colonies since it's easy and free. If you do though, ensure the protein source you catch is free of pesticides and parasites since that could harm your colony or even wipe it out overnight. If you can't confidently say you're 100% sure that there's no nasty things on the protein source, my recommendation is don't feed it to your ants. 
it's not worth taking the risk. To help eliminate parasites, I've had freezing is a great method. This principle also applies to the soil or sand or anything else you might put in an outwilder's decoration. For protein, I now prefer to use crickets. I used to solely use mealworms, but I found they dry out too quickly. Crickets just seem to work better for ants. I think it has something to do with the joints, maybe? Helping keep the different parts of the cricket fresh? I don't know. But when I use a cricket, I separate it into two primary sections. Legs, which go to queen ants on their own, and the rest of the cricket for the bigger colonies. The legs are very manageable for a small colony, but the body just goes to waste. And when I give the legs to bigger colonies, I feel like the legs would just be so much better for the queen ants. It just makes sense to me to split it up. Speaking of crickets, did you know you can breed them? I'm going to make a tutorial about breeding an unlimited supply of crickets. Be sure to check that out when I release it. Breeding crickets is easy once it's set up and will save you a lot of money in the long run. There are many different types of protein sources you can use. I often use protein jellies to supplement the crickets. Although I have noticed that generally, the bigger colonies prefer the jelly more than single queens on their own. Most of the time, if it's a queen on her own or a queen with just a couple of workers, they don't really even touch the jelly. Whereas the bigger colonies will consume whatever chunk I place in the outworld in a matter of days. Whatever you use or however you use it, just create a feeding schedule. Remember to write down when you need to feed them again so you don't forget. When housing your ants, there are endless options for nests and outworlds. I recommend to try and make your own first. It's not overly difficult and there's plenty of tutorials out there for making every type of setup. If you can't make your own or simply would just prefer to buy one, then I'd suggest to pick one that has the features you want and is the right size for your colony. I've made this mistake many times and that is moving a colony into a setup that's too big. Turns out, I used to always find it difficult to estimate what size nest is the right fit for a new up and coming colony. If the nest is too big, the colony will use a section of the nest as a dumping ground for the waste products, which is called frass. This will become a mold-ridden zone close to the delicate queen and brood, which you definitely want to avoid. When setting up your outworld, try adding in sand or some kind of substrate for the larvae to spin cocoons. Some types of ants will spin a cocoon around them after the larvae stage. If it's available, they use bits of sand or substrate to help them do this. Sometimes even the workers will stick bits of substrate to help the larvae. The setup you use is super precious, so treat it carefully. Always wash your hands before setting up a test tube. If the cotton you place has germs on it, it will go moldy really quickly, which means you'll have to move the colony out faster than you would have otherwise. Also, research what type of moisture and humidity the species you own prefers. Or if you don't know, experiment and consider how you'd seen them live in the wild. The meat ant prefers dry, sandy, coarse soil. They create open spaces where they kill off the vegetation. Whereas the Campanotus genus generally prefers to nest in leafy substrates, rotting trees and stumps. Knowing the preferred living conditions is vital for creating a happy, healthy colony. Along with humidity and substrate, ants need to be in a dark environment with the least amount of vibrations as possible. I keep the ants on one shelf and all my bits and pieces on another. This helps keep vibrations to a minimum. I'm not constantly bumping the shelf like I used to, getting the things I need. I am lucky enough to have a dedicated ant room. However, a shoebox in the cupboard, like how I started off, is all you really need. Some ants are particularly sensitive to vibrations, like the green weaver ant colony. To help overcome this, get yourself a piece of foam and cut out a hole in the middle of it, or use a foam tube, then make a foil cylinder. Insert the test tube inside the foil and foam piece. This creates a still, pitch black setup, perfect for those extra delicate ants.
I use and recommend 20mm diameter glass test tubes. If you can get your hands on them, you totally should. They're clearer to see through compared to plastic, and 20mm is just a good size for all ants big and small. Sometimes if you have been keeping a colony in a test tube for a while, the water reservoir will go bad. It's worth getting yourself an adapter like this one, or you can make one using some sort of adhesive tape. The ants will move along on their own to get away from mouldy water. If you just keep the colony in a test tube like this one, they'll just die one day when you go to check up on them. So to avoid that headache, move the colony before it gets too bad. When moving ants from one test tube to another, or from one setup to another, remember to exercise patience and don't rush the move. Never forcibly move them if you can avoid it. This will cause immense stress on the queen and could cause her to die. Instead, cover up where you want them to move into and even add some heat to speed up the process. Although this can still take time. I had a colony that took nearly a month to move out of the light into the new nest, although most take no longer than a couple of days to make the move. On the topic of heating, the use of a heat cord or heat mat are an excellent way to promote growth in the colony. Just make sure you have created a warm space and a cool space for the colony to move their brood. If it gets too hot, the colony will move the brood into the outworld. The use of a reliable thermostat is ideal for instances like these. There are some must-haves for any ant keeper that you may have not have considered before. A black light is really worth giving a go for catching queen ants during a nuptial flight. I made a video all about trying this idea out with amazing results. I caught queen ants then that are now established colonies today. Also, fluon is something that some ant keepers haven't taken the plunge to invest in. Fluon is a liquid barrier you can apply to surfaces to stop ants from escaping. But you can also make it using two basic ingredients. One part talcum powder to one part alcohol. As you can see, I measure this extremely carefully. And having done so, I have created a paste-like consistency. To apply it, use a piece of cotton and paint swirl-like marks to create the barrier. I've actually found this recipe can last longer than fluon. For example, I applied fluon around the edge of this setup around 10 days ago. Whereas I applied the homemade recipe about 6 weeks ago to these two tubs and tube setups. Another must have for any ant keeper is to get yourself two good pairs of tweezers, just in case you drop one in an outworld of angry stinging ants. I've dropped my only pair of tweezers in the outworld before and it wasn't fun. Save yourself the trouble and get two. I mean, have you ever heard of someone complain about having two sets of tweezers? Exactly. As an ant keeper, something that gets easily overlooked is getting yourself a good white light to view your ants under. Ants have the most amazing colors and features that really come to life under good light. If you don't have good light to view them under, you're really doing yourself a disservice. Get yourself a really nice white light to enjoy your ants. Brood boosting is something I've been experimenting with lately that seems to be pretty bulletproof if you follow a couple of super basic steps. Of course, using brood that is the same species is a requirement and ensuring that you're only donating brood and not workers. I've done this a couple of times where I experience the death of a queen and have a second colony of the same species. It's a great way to make the most of a terrible situation. And it has encouraged me to hold two of the same species as a way to prepare for the unlikely event but possibility of losing a queen ant. If you follow the steps I've covered so far in this episode, you shouldn't have too many deaths among your collection. I'd be interested to know if anyone has experimented with brood boosting in the past and what they found with their results. I've often said in the past to always keep a small jar or container with you when you go out and about. I have literally found dozens of queens just going about my regular routine. You'll never want to find a queen ant and not have a means to capture it. Although it's amazing how resourceful you can be when you're stuck. I once used a bottle cap, a leaf, and my shoelace to capture a queen camper notice I found when I wasn't prepared. And yes, it was in public. I looked crazy taking my shoelace off to capture an ant. 
Actually, now I think about it. Yeah, it's it's pretty pretty crazy. I'm crazy. Hmm. Moving on. These are some, but not all the tips to help make you the ultimate ant keeper. I'd like to know from you, what are some great tips that you can share to help out other ant keepers? Write them down in the comment section below for everyone to see. If you made it this far, then make sure to hit the like button if you enjoyed this video. It really helps me out. Also, have you subscribed and become part of the AK Colony? If you haven't, then what are you waiting for? Subscribe and join the ants keeping community and be part of one of the fastest growing colonies here on YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you on the next video. Until then, ants keepers unite.